Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're talking about Asia, but we're talking about Asia from an historical point of view and from a media point of view. We have with us uh, Scott Bailey. Uh, Scott is an assistant professor of history at Kansai Gaidai University in Hyogo. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, uh, it's in Hirakata City. Uh, Hirakata City. Yeah. Uh, in Japan. In Japan. And he's here in Hawaii to sort of, you know, have a visit of his old stomping grounds because he has a PhD, his, his initial PhD <laughs> in history That's here correct. at UH Manoa. That's correct. Uh, and he studied under Je Jerry Bentley there. That's correct. In he fact, Jerry advisor. Bentley was the reason you came here, isn't it? Uh, very much so, yes. Originally, back in uh, when I applied for PhD programs. Yeah. Uh, 15 years ago, yeah. uh, I really wanted to study world history, and, and Jerry Bentley was, you know, a giant of, of that field. And you were on the mainland, and you knew of him there. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I was in Central Asia at the time, uh, working in a university, and I wanted to continue on with my PhD study, and uh, University of Hawaii was the place that I really wanted to go because I wanted to study under Jerry Bentley, and um, the dream came true, and, and I was here uh, for about five years um, and earned my PhD in 2008. What did you focus on in the PhD? Uh, my PhD um, coursework focused on world history for the most part, uh, but uh, the, the dissertation itself was about the Russian colonization of Central Asia in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a project that I'm continuing to work on uh, to some degree. I'm, I'm revising it now into book format. Uh, to be, it's to be published as a book next year, early next year by uh, a press. I'd like to have another show with you sometime. <laughs> Thank we you. talk about Russian colonization <laughs> of Asia. <you> know? <laughs> and the book. <laughs> Thank you for having me, by the way. Jay. Oh, absolutely. So uh, what, what other areas have you studied and published in your career? Um, I, besides my interest in, in colonization and imperialism in general, uh, I'm also uh, doing a lot of interested work now in the relationship between film and history. Uh, and that's where my uh, teaching interests have kind of lied in the last few years. Um, I started developing a course uh, about six years ago at University of California, Berkeley uh, during the summer uh, called Recent World History Through Film. And uh, that led to um, creating a second course which was called Cross-Cultural Encounters on Film. Um, and since coming to Kansai Gaidai, my, my, my university, I, I now use film and history in a lot of the topics. Um, and so uh, some of my publishing efforts now are, are directed towards, towards the relationship between film and history. Yeah. And especially uh, trying to look at um, how filmmakers' representation of the past should not be discounted uh, by historians. Because I think there is some perception that it's somehow so, inferior as a form of history. So just to be clear, you're not only talking about filmmakers who are filming current events, that is, events that have happened since we invented, since Thomas Edison uh -huh. invented the motion picture camera. Right. Um, but, but filmmakers who have done, I guess, documentaries or maybe fiction films Absolutely. about events sweeping right back to Charlton Heston in ancient <laughs> Rome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm... I, Personally, I'm, I do less work on, on ancient history or, the, or those uh, types of films, but, but the representation of history in, in any film is something that's interesting to me. And f for trying to get my students to think critically about, uh, I, I want them to really challenge themselves to, to think, you know, what is, what is the, the statement that this filmmaker is trying to make about the past? And in some cases, I think in most cases, films are not just commenting on the past. They're commenting on the present, and they're trying to send a message to the audience about the present or the future. Uh, the old takeaway. <laughs> yeah, even in a, a documentary, there's always a takeaway. Sure, you know? sure, absolutely. So yeah. you have to look into the mind of the filmmaker. You do. You have to know your filmmaker before you can you appreciate his vision, what he is seeing, before you can look through his eyes. Absolutely. How do you do that? Well, one, one way is to study, and this is what I encourage my students to do, is to study uh, not just the historical context of the subject matter of the film, but the historical context under which the film was made. That is, the place that it was made, the production company or studio that made that film, 
Who paid to produce that film? Uh, what was the location? What was going on in politics at the moment that the film was being made? And how does that, how does that you know, maybe reflect how the narrative was presented historically? It, it comes to mind a uh, film that's fairly recent, but I think it's historic, and that's Ai Weiwei's film called Human Flow, okay. uh -huh. uh, where he takes us for a, a journey around the world for all these camps where people are, are held uh, as, mm -hmm. as migrants and the like. And it's a shockeroo mm. in the sense that you didn't know there were 60 million people in these camps. <laughs> and he, has, he uses drones, very high tech, and right. he gets right there on the ground. Yeah. But the thing about Ai Weiwei is that he's a troublemaker. Right, he's right. a dissident. <laughs> so if you want to know what he's doing, you have to look at it through his eyes. You have to know sure. him. <laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we were talking um, before the show started a little bit about the movie JFK, uh, which was produced by Oliver Stone. And Stone is one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, who's obviously, he's made a lot of films about American history um, and, and kind of exposing some of the maybe um, <laughs> lesser known elements of, of American history and, and maybe kind of a darker side. And sometimes, sometimes conspiratorial. To, sometimes he's been labeled as a conspiracy. Uh, a conspiratorial director, you might say. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you know, among people who study film and history, like myself, sco many scholars believe that that Stone is actually very historically minded, um, and that you know the the kind of um, effort that he makes in in producing films, in getting consultants who are professional historians, is is actually really admirable, um, and. Um, uh, you, you can certainly agree or disagree with, with his uh, whatever kind of narratives that he presents, but if nothing else, he does, in, in most of the films that he's produced, I think, uh, raise a kind of question in the, in the yeah. mind of the audience to make them want to know for themselves, okay, was this, was this actually what happened or, or not? Yeah. Um, and, and I think he, he likes to, to choose kind of assumptions and and maybe it's he iconic the classic. He, yeah, right? absolutely. He, he wants to provoke you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. He, wa he wants to take a leap uh, yeah. in some way in order to make you think about other possibilities. Yeah. And I think what's important there is I was going to ask you about this is how important is it mm -hmm. that the theater goer, the average person, not the PhD in history, <laughs> the average person study up on Stone before you go to see that movie. Oh, in in yeah. Stone's movies, we <laughs> right. all knew because it was, sure. it was a lot of press about what he did and how provocative right. he was. Right. But, you know, potentially that's the case with every film. Well, I, yeah, I think I, I would encourage everyone, you know, and I think this is a, is a, is a broader issue for the media in general. Everyone should really uh, be doing a more active job of trying to analyze who are the producers of the media that they're consuming. Uh, I think most... People, as you as you kind of alluded to, are, are somewhat passive, uh, you know, receptors for, for the media that they consume. Uh, but it's important for us to, for all of us, to to at least know, okay, what are what are the the basic beliefs that this person is bringing? What are the, what is the background that this person is bringing to the to their projects? Because um, that helps us to, to to be better educated as citizens. And, and when we read newspapers, when we read uh, when we watch local news or or uh, television news, that, <laughs> that that often gets lost, and I think that's yeah. that shouldn't be. Well, well, you know, if you're watching CNN, you have to know what CNN is, mm -hmm. so you can more fully appreciate what, what their message, right. the message they want to convey to you. Same thing with Fox News. Yeah. So you have to appreciate the source. Yes. And I, and I find this interesting, because this, this is really touching on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So if I see a film... Uh, and I know that it's trying to provoke me or trying mm -hmm. to sell me a bill of goods, yep. sell me a takeaway that, that's troublesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happened in, uh, in the 30s in, in Germany where the films were propaganda, right. and, I, and people bought them. Uh, and the, it's, it sounds to me like there's a risk uh, that people will buy into a film and believe it as mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. It's a big word these days in the, yeah. in the Trump administration. They will buy into <laughs> it and treat it yeah. as truth when it has a takeaway that isn't true at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. aren't, aren't we talking about that? Um, well, I, I think any filmmaker who's producing a film about a historical topic is, is trying to aspire to the truth. Uh, however, you know, we, we know as, as scholars of film and, and history that all filmmakers engage in a certain amount of adjustments and, and fabrications and, 
and elaborations of, of, the, of the truth. But, but that's inherent to the nature of all historical sources in that you know, you're, you're presenting your own narrative, you're presenting as a historian or as a historical filmmaker, you're presenting your viewpoint of how you think things happened. You're not presenting, um, a, it's not as if we had a camera on the wall where we can replay and watch a historical event from start to finish in most cases. Uh, it's not that simple, right? Uh, as historians, we're trying to reconstruct from a variety of sources what we think happened, our best estimation of what happened. Yeah, um, well, but not all historians agree on not all issues. I mean, just what pops into my mind is this, the story of the Turner Joy, the, Go the Gulf of Tonkin, mm -hmm. just before the Vietnam War. And, and right now, you could walk down the street or on the military bases of, of this city and find some military people who believe that the Turner Joy was a legitimate you know, event, a, mm -hmm. a provocation, right. justifying uh, you know, 10 years of Vietnam War. Sure. Uh, others, others will say, no, this was a government manipulation. Yep. It, was, it was not real. Mm -hmm. And so you can take two filmmakers in the same way. Yep. Maybe Oliver Stone's one of them, but there's another one too, sure. right? And we examine it and we make it look a little different because there's no cameras on scene at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So you have to build you know, the story, the narrative by what you produce with your, your cameras today. Absolutely. So I could be selling you a bill of goods. <laughs> and, you, and as a historian, you're gonna put your own imprimatur on that, whether mm -hmm. it's true or not, yeah? Uh, you know, historians love to second guess historical filmmakers <laughs> when, when, when the film comes out that's within their, their particular area. But, you know, I think to some extent, uh, that's, that, that's often a bit premature and maybe, um, uncalled for in, in some cases. I mean, a lot of films, popular films, are intended to be entertainment, right? Um, I mean, documentaries are different, like we were talking about Ken Burns' films. Those are basically uh, his genre of filmmaking that he's created and others have, have kind of emulated in the last 20 years is, is much closer to uh, a traditional historical source. Of course, it's, it's, it's much it's very entertaining to 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 well, watch what he has. You to care say. about what happened in the world, right? I mean, I I am entertained by that. Maybe entertainment is not exactly the right word, but I right. I am fascinated with it. Yeah. And you know, I, I went through that period. It's part of my life, hmm. so I'm very interested to see what he picked up when he researched it and then shows it to me. Right. Uh, but what what is really interesting is this. Mm -hmm. So I had a certain perception of the Vietnam War. I was, I was yeah. in the service at the time. Right. Um, and I come away from all of that with a certain mental set. Mm -hmm. uh, now I see Ken Burns' Vietnam yeah. today. It changes my mental What did you, what did you think of it? Yeah, well, I, I thought it was great. It yeah. taught me so much that I didn't know, and it accentuated right. some points that I wasn't sure about. Sure. And I felt I was getting, for the first time, the mm -hmm. real deal. Right. That's what I felt. Other people may not feel exactly the same way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, now, now raise the level of distribution of this film, mm -hmm. and it, it was at a very high level, mm -hmm. um, to 300 million Americans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, they all saw the film. Right. It colors their impression of what happened in the Vietnam War. Right. It, it, now, it has an effect on them, and this, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about this, really. Yeah. It has an effect on them. They, their perception of the Vietnam War has probably changed, as mine was. Right. Um, and right. when those issues come up again, whether there's an, when there's another mm -hmm. Turner Joy incident in the Gulf of Tonkin, mm -hmm. uh, when there's another effort by you know people in the military or the in the in the in the Defense Department to mm -hmm. get us into a war, they're mm -hmm. going to be thinking differently than they might have been before sure. they saw that movie. Absolutely, they, and they and they should. I mean, they, they should be able to learn from that. Um, from, from the information that was presented in Burns' documentary. But I think in a free society, uh, in an open society, uh, that's not the only interpretation that's out there. And people are, should uh, you know, actively s try to read books about the Vietnam War and tr try to get different interpretations so that they're not just relying strictly on what you know, Burn, uh, Ken Burns' interpretation of the Vietnam War is. You know, that's the difference between living in a free and open society versus a an authoritarian state where, where you know, the, the access to that kind of information may not exist and, and there may only be uh, a film or a single book or something that, that interprets that entire event and, and is the authoritative voice of that event for the entire mm. body politic. Uh, and that's, that's what we, as a society, I think should try to steer clear of. We better understand where we are because we really need to understand history to know where we are and where we're going. 
yeah. and we should have um, as sophisticated, as nuanced an understanding as we, we possibly can to, uh, to find the reality. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I'm with you, of course. We are all together trying to find the truth here. But sometimes the truth isn't obvious. Mm. And sometimes people may get the wrong message. Sure. And we live in a time when the media, including film, can give you the wrong message. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and this is the point I'd like to discuss right after we finish our break, is that the, the film is portraying history. Mm -hmm. But the effect of the film on the public, 300 million Americans or 8 billion people in the world, that film may have an effect on what they do. Mm -hmm. So what you yes. have is a two-way street, a feedback loop, two-way street. And so I can see why you're so excited about this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's Scott Bailey. Uh, he's an assistant professor of history, trained here in Hawaii as a Ph.D. history student, world history. Um, and he is teaching at Kansai Gaidai University in Hirakata City, Hirakata Japan. City, Japan. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmers series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert. And we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m. and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Okay, we're back, we're back with Scott Bailey and we're talking about films and history. This is really an interesting connection. This films are history and history are films. Yeah. You see that right? <laughs> so um, what kind of films are we talking about for your examination of things? Well, um, one film that I really enjoy uh, showing to my, my students was, is an old uh, film from the early 1960s by an Italian director named Ponte Corvino. And it, the film was called The Battle of Algiers, um, which is black and white film uh, about the um, Algerian Revolution and, and war against the French colonization. What year? And, uh, this was in uh, 19, early 1960s uh, okay. is when the film came out. Um, but it's portraying events from the 1950s. Mm. Um, but what's interesting about the film, it's not a strict you know, uh, documentary account of what happened. It's a drama that mixes uh, known bits of what happened uh, into the narrative. Um, and um, in the film, um, it, it, it basically provides kind of an understanding for my students of how revolutions can work um, and how revolutions have happened in the 20th century. And so I use that film in comparison with other films that also portray uh, the process of decolonization in the 20th century uh, to kind of give them a comparative look at how different states moved away from colonization in the middle of the 20th century. What a great study. I want to be in that class. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, but uh, what, you, what you signal to me is that the film itself doesn't have to be specifically accurate on every point. No. That we can allow Absolutely. some fiction in there. We can allow uh, yeah. a kind of broader treatment of a, of a subject. What we yeah. are looking for, at least right. in comparing these films, is the gestalt of, of how colonization came to an end. That's right. Which is really important. Yeah. And the films which were made at the time uh, reflect the filmmaker's concept of what was happening at the time That's in right. terms of the, uh, the reduction, the d diminution of colonization. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and part of the reason that films cannot provide a 100% documentary uh, kind of uh, portrayal of the event 
is they're, they're what, two hours long. So you, there's a lot of selection process that has to go into what do you include in the film, what do you leave out, how do you, uh, you, you know, you can't have more than uh, maybe five or six main characters or it gets too confusing yeah, for the audience to understand. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't have 20 hours to watch the film, so, you know, so there's a lot of that process that happens, but, you know, that's, that's the nature of the genre. Yeah, but suppose I came to you and said, Scott, look, I need to know about how colonization mm -hmm. really ended here in, in that period, 50s, 60s, for that matter, after. Yeah. Um, and I would like to find out what people were thinking about it at the mm -hmm. time. I'd like to see through the lens of their filmmakers' experience yeah. um, in these various countries yeah. to see how it declined. Um, so can you please find me half a dozen movies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that treated the subject mm -hmm. and take clips from them, yeah. assuming you had the, the right, right to do that. You, know, right. I, you have to ask people, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and make me a movie where you have the you know, essential story yeah. from each one of those locations and colonies right. where you can, you can show me the underlying process mm -hmm. as sort of as a universal truth. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Would you do that? Do you want to do that? Can I be there when you do that? <laughs> it, it would take a while, <laughs> but, but it would be a noble pursuit, I think, to try that. Um, you know, what I do in my classes is I, is I, try, to, I try to have a comparative approach. Um, and it's not, cons it's not intended to be an encyclopedic approach. We're not, we're not getting our students to know every single detail of what happened in the past. Um, that, that's not really um, something that's necessary. What, what we're trying to get is, is to get them to engage with the ideas and to get them to become familiar with a range of different scenarios that happened. And so, you know, when I show the Battle of Algiers movie, I, I compare it with uh, the film Gandhi, uh, which was in the early 1980s. Uh, and that, you know, that's a very different process of how essentially Indian independence happened, uh, South Asian independence, I should say, happened in uh, the 1940s uh, versus what happened in Algeria in, some, in, in a place where there was more of a violent revolutionary effort. So, um, so films you know, can, can help students get the basic foundational understanding of how historical processes like decolonization or revolution have happened in different places. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that really goes to uh, the whole thing about history, my observation. Yeah. By the way, full disclosure, I minored in American history <laughs> oh, in college. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Journalism major, I assume. <laughs> well, I, I, my, 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 my point of reference was the, the, what they called the Mumford Decades oh, okay. between the Civil War and 1890. That was my favorite time. Oh, I see. Oh. Uh, but, you know, but I, think the, I think you're making a point that I want to explore, and that is that history is not a matter of, of going through the gouge and saying, on this day this happened, on that day Absolutely. that happened, at all. You, 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 wanna, you wanna feel the, may I use Ai Weiwei's uh, term, human flow. That's right. You wanna feel the flow of history. You wanna feel the way the, the species has changed, yep. the way the, the thinking among millions, billions of people That's is correct. changing. That's yeah. correct. That's right. and, and, and our goal is not to memorize information, it's not to become Computers, we, we have computers to do that. We have the internet to, to, to help us with, with uh, keeping track of that information. Um, our, our goal is to create engaged learners who can critically think for themselves. And to me, films can stimulate a certain part of, of, a, of a student's consciousness um, and make them become interested and engaged and want to, to go out and research for themselves. You know, how did uh, Indian independence actually happened. What did Gandhi and and you know the nonviolence movement in India? What how did how did that work? Um, how how did Algeria eventually gain its independence? You know, um, so so films can provide that kind of platform to get that to spark that that interest and to get them to want to 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 really think independently. And that's really to me the ultimate goal of history education. Yeah, and actually, it goes beyond history. It's the yeah. human condition. It's all these millions nice. and billions of people. How do they, how do they conduct themselves in the mm -hmm. world? How have, if you learn how they have conducted themselves, then maybe you can get a bead on how they will conduct themselves. Absolutely. That's not easy, but maybe that'll help. Um, and, I, and I suggest that maybe your students, they see some films, they hear your discussion, they, they try to develop critical thinking about the, the connection between the, the film, which is portrayed in the film, and, and, and the real history. 
um, and they take something away from that. Now they go out into the world mm -hmm. where they're surrounded with films. I mean, mm -hmm. so many films. You can, mm -hmm. you can watch you know, films oh. day and night and never come to 1% <laughs> of it. Yes. And, and from these films, which turn out to be very educational, mm -hmm. they learn a lot about the world. I mean, is Absolutely. that, you're trying to foment that sort of process? I, I would, yeah. I mean, uh, intellectual curiosity, curiosity for uh, other parts of the world, I mean, so many uh, students do not have the, the opportunity to travel uh, econ for economic reasons or, or other reasons. And, and so to see other places, to, to experience other, other viewpoints, uh, I think that that helps create this kind of cross-cultural understanding that's, that's really hard to get across you know, in, in just in books or, or art, reading articles versus kind of seeing that on screen and and you know ideally watching films that are in foreign languages, oh, yeah. um, so that students you know are get even more of a sense of of uh, other uh, an otherness or or a different cultural difference that they can become uh, interested in. And so you know I try to I try to show um, more foreign films as well um, with in, subtitles. In my classes with subtitles. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, although students often complain that they don't want to read the subtitles. But, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, really, this is an education um, in global terms. Mm -hmm. It's an education of the whole enchilada, and I mean, you know, I think everyone should do this. And what's an interesting point, though, is that, you know, you, you talk about people who can't travel. Well, a lot of us can't travel anymore. Why? Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous out there, wow. that's why. Yeah, and, and I think the strange thing is that Sometimes you take a trip through the movies you watch That's true. when you could never actually go to that That's place. That's true. That's true. So you're relegated. To, you have to yeah. rely on the film to teach you about the place. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And and it's better than than nothing, right? I mean, it, it it still can can provide some some exposure to to other viewpoints and other other societies, and I think that's a good thing. You, well, you you def, you d describe a world where these students have the benefit of this extra sort of Extra, extra level of education, extra level of creative thinking, mm. um, and I and I just I have one more question for you before yeah. our time is up, and that is, are you the only one? Uh, are you in touch with you collaborating with other professors of history who make the same comparison with film and mm. see it through the lens of the filmmaker? Uh, and and mm. the second part, B sure, B sure. on that question yeah. is. Where is this study going? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be bigger in five or ten years? Is this going to have more effect on, on the products of our universities? Uh, great, great question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, there is an increasing number of history educators who are, who are like me, employing the use of film and, and turning to film as something that's really important for the classroom uh, and very beneficial for the classroom. And so, yes, there are uh, more and more professors who are going towards the use of this in the classroom. And you know, personally, from my own uh, perspective, I'm, I am hoping to to uh, you know go with a publishing uh, agenda in this area towards uh, the teaching of, of film and world history yeah. uh, because I think it's something that that is very beneficial for the students, and it's something that um, you know I found the the students overwhelmingly uh, enjoy, um, and I think the learning outcomes are also quite significant from. Uh, a properly structured class that employs the use of film and history. And this process, this, this phenomenon among the students, it's universal, isn't it? It's everywhere in the world. Yeah. It's every country, every university, right. every possibility. Right, right. So, so then Think Tech ought to stay in business and expand its operations to including filmmaking. <laughs> Why not? Maybe documentaries more and more. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jay. Scott Bailey. Thank you. Great to talk with you. Great to talk with you. Thank Aloha. you.